start in verse 1 of Luke 15. We're actually going to read the whole chapter. Jesus is teaching, and in Luke chapter 15, he's going to, um, he's going to use three stories to drive home a point that he's trying to get across. As we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks, um, Jesus will, when he's really wanting to drive a point home, he'll tell a story to drive it home. And, and so we see him, in this case, tell three stories in a row. And when God does something three times, you might just want to listen a little bit more because that's even more important. So he's telling a story, and he's going to tell three stories to drive home one point. And what point is he driving home? Well, we get it from verses 1 and 2 in Luke chapter 15. So let's read it together. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. Now, I'm going to pause here um, because this is really important that we understand the, the, the tension that's being, that's being set up here by Luke as he's describing what was going on. First of all, when we see the word sinners, you know, like, like in our church, we'll say, Many times you'll hear me say, like, we're all sinners, because that's true. We're all sinners. But the, so when you read that he was associating with sinners, it can be like, you know, you, you cannot think much of it. But you have to understand that when the Bible's saying that he was associating with sinful people, notorious sinners, it says. Notorious sinners is how the NLT translates it. That's because it's talking about the word sinner, specifically it means devoted to sin, especially wicked and then, and here's the third definition, specifically of men stained with certain definite vices or crimes. Then it also uses the word tax collectors, sinners and tax collectors. Well, why does it pick a random occupation um, to, to associate with sinners? Well, that's because tax collectors were like really, really looked down upon in Jewish culture. Tax collectors specifically were looked down upon by Jews because Jews thought of them as traitors. They had no respect in the Jewish community. Um, because here's what tax collectors would do. The, the tax collect, collectors were often corrupt. They were in charge of, of gathering the taxes from the people, but time and time again, here's what they were doing. They would gather more taxes than they actually owed and pocket some for themselves. They would actually deputize workers that would go out and collect the taxes, and they would pocket some themselves too. It was like this corrupt scheme that's going on. It, it would seem more like a, a, a drug you know, uh, 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 production system that was happening. They, the, the, the deputized people were pocketing money. They were passing money that's, that was even larger than it should have been to the main tax collector, and they were pocketing part of it. People were getting ripped off and stolen from by tax collectors, and people knew this, but they, can't, they couldn't do anything about it. So tax collectors were seen as scum, like the lowest of lows as sinners. And rabbis, the Jewish teachers, would juxtapose, they would compare and contrast in their teaching the Pharisees with tax collectors. So when they were talking about godly people and ungodly people, and they, were, and they were giving examples, they would say, for example, Pharisees, the most godly people, Pharisees were the religious leaders, and tax collectors. These are like the most ungodly people possible. And so you could apply that to today, like who would be the most spiritual people that you would give an example of, and who would be like the most despicable of despicable. This was, they, these were the most despicable people, tax collectors. And you have to understand that to understand how, how perplexed the religious leaders were that Jesus would associate, not just with bad people, with the worst of the worst, okay? And then you need to understand what eating and dining with someone represented. In ancient Israel, the, the table, the dinner table, was, 
it, it wasn't like our culture where you just eat while you're watching TV. The dinner table was a place of deep fellowship where, listen to this, where spiritual matters were discussed. So the dinner table was a spiritual place. I love that. I would have done good back then because for me, eating is borderline spiritual. Come on, how many love food? There ain't nothing like a good meal and, and laughing and having a good time with good friends like that. That's just a, a great time like that. And that's, eating was a big deal. Dining together was a deep, intimate form of fellowship. In fact, the term dinner that we see I want to come have dinner at your house. In the Bible is oftentimes the word dinner means what we would call banquet. So, so it's not like I'm just going to make spaghetti. It's like, no, we're going to have a banquet. And we're going, to, we're going to feast and we're going to fellowship and we're going to have, and it would be hours long. Eating with someone established, listen to this, a covenant relationship of friendship, which also signified approval of that person. Okay, one writer, when writing about the ancient culture, shared that in one ancient story, two warriors stopped fighting each other mid-battle when they discovered that their fathers had shared a meal together. The issue of eating and dining with, sin with, with sinners was sensitive in Judaism, since Jews believed that eating with people approved of their behavior, approved of the person, and, and said that I'm in a covenant relationship with you, okay? So you can feel the tension building in the Gospels when Jesus is not only associating with and talking to, but dining with sinners, dining with tax collectors. So here's what happens. When I was growing up, you know, I, I would hear these stories and I would, I would hear about the attitude of the Pharisees towards Jesus. And I would be as a kid, I'm just like mad at the Pharisees. I'm like stupid Pharisees. You know, like the Pharisees are just like, we, we as Christians who understand, if you understand the Bible and you understand what Jesus came to do and stuff, we can get an attitude towards the Pharisees. Like these were the, the hypocritical, mean, you know, religious old men. How many of you have ever thought of them like that? Like there's just the, those hypocritical, mean, religious old men, like the, those Pharisees, those Sadducees, those, those religious leaders. I, I have had an attitude towards them. But here's, the, the older I get, here's what I realize. I am like them. So before we just write the, the Pharisees off as these like judgmental old men, we need to realize, no, we are like the Pharisees many times. Because it's understandable they understood their culture. We oftentimes, we don't understand the culture. We don't realize the depth of what Jesus was doing, like the depth of offense that these people were feeling because as, a, as Jews, you don't do this, especially as a Jewish rabbi. Now he's starting to, you're starting to figure out he's claiming he's the son of God, he's forgiving sin, especially this guy who's going around and, and performing healings. And like, you can imagine, you can set yourself in the tension and feel the offense that they had as this, this man who is rising up as a leader of the Jewish people, at least claiming he is, but yet he is going against everything that Jewish culture would stand for. So before we like write off the Pharisees, we need to realize there was, a, there was an indignation in them that might, could even be classified as righteous. At that time, we know the end of the story, but to them, it's like they were standing up for what they believed in. And so you can feel the tension rising as Jesus is just associating and dining with such scum, as the Bible even calls it in some translations. So the religious leaders understand sin. They understand the magnitude of sin. They understand the consequence of sin. They, they understand Jewish history. They understand cleansing, cere cleansing ceremony. They understand religious ritual. They understand all of these things. And they're watching Jesus act this way, and it's causing them to have consternation. And you need to understand that's why we've been going through the, this, this series. That's why we've been going through this teaching. That's why we've been building kind of themes by theme, block by block, leading up to Easter because we can't understand the power of it unless we, like the Pharisees, at least to some level, understand the magnitude of our sin, which is why that's where we started. So we understand the magnitude of sin. We've been talking about how God can't associate with, with, with 
uh, unclean people, unclean things, because he's perfect and he's holy. That's what they understood. So you can understand the tension, right? Yet Jesus constantly, from the beginning of his ministry, is just going against the grain. For example, we get in Matthew 9, as he's calling his disciples, we see that he decides that one of his disciples is going to be a tax collector. In Matthew, watch this, Matthew 9, 9. See, some of you might not have known that. I know a lot of you do. You already understand the Bible. You've known this. But some of you might not even know that. You heard what I just said about tax collectors. One of his disciples was. Guess what? The, the one that wrote the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, it says, as Jesus was walking along, Matthew 9, 9, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. So you imagine a toll booth. There were tax collection booths along popular routes. You couldn't get by them. When you get there, you would get patted down. You would literally, the only people they couldn't pat down was Roman women. Everybody else, you're gonna, they're gonna find everything that you have, and they're taking part of it. Where is Matthew when Jesus calls him? Sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. Talk about a tone setter. The son of God shows up to the earth. He's gonna pick 12 men to be his followers, his disciples, and then the apostles that are gonna be the first people that start the New Testament church, that start spreading the gospel. The first place that he stops is among the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. Hey, Matthew, come out of your tax collector's booth. Be my follower. You're gonna be one of the main ones. So Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up and he followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. And that's, that's the beginning of Jesus going from the outside to the inside. You're good at offering sacrifices. How about show mercy? In other words, it's heart. It's heart over what you do. And then he says this, for I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. This is radical because up until now, the sinners are the ones who bring the judgment of God. These are the ones that you stay separate from as Jews. You don't associate with them. That's the very people you're supposed to be separate from, yet Jesus is calling them to be in his inner circle. Do you feel the tension? He, another example, when, when the woman, the sinful woman, who has a reputation, if you know what I mean, comes to, to Jesus, the, the house that he's staying at, and she begins to anoint his feet. She, she's crying, and she's washing his feet with her tears and with her hair. She, she's showing him worship. She's showing him humility, and the Pharisee can't believe that he would let such a sinner touch him, and Jesus responds and says, this worship is flowing from the depth of the love that she feels for me, from the forgiveness, and he says, those who have been forgiven little, love little. This is where we get that, that phrase, but those who have been forgiven much will love much, and we talked about that last week. When we realize the depth of our sin, we realize the depth of our forgiveness, which translates to the depth of our worship and our adoration for who God is. So there's a, there's a, a snarky, there's a, there's a judgmental looking down at their nose. Why would Jesus associate with her? And Jesus gives us the, that, that statement that says, those who have been forgiven little love, little. Zacchaeus, the notorious tax collector, tax collector of tax collectors who stole from people, and he had a reputation that he's the worst of the worst. Everyone hated him. And he climbs up in the tree to get a look at this Jesus. I, I'm, I'm praying that there'll be people who would be considered worst of the worst who would come into church on Easter and try to get a look at this Jesus. He had a look at this move of God. What is happening here? He climbs up the tree to get a look at this Jesus who everybody's following, sinner of sinners. And Jesus looks up to him and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your home to dine with you tonight. 
and the people were upset and they began to murmur and grumble behind his back. And how could he do that? How could he eat there? And Jesus says, for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Time and time and time again, Jesus is associating with willingly, dining with, interacting with sinners that nobody else would associate with. And, and the tension is, there, we know, the religious knew that, G, that you can't just approach God any old way. And so there has to be separation from the unholy and the holy. And the Jews reflected that in how they lived their lives, everyone. They didn't associate, but here Jesus is associating. You can't approach God as a sinner. There are cleansing rituals. There are things you have to do. There are priests you have to go through, yet Jesus associates with them. Why? This is big because he is establishing that he is becoming the way to approach God. He can associate with them because he is the way to God, and that's what he's establishing. Jesus, friend of sinners. So let's pick our story back up. The, the tax collectors, the sinners, they're, they're, they're complaining that he's associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them a story. Everybody say, uh-oh. Uh-oh, that means Jesus, he's, he's got to drive a point home here. They don't understand something, so here he goes. He's going to tell them a story. Verse 3, Jesus told them this story. If a man has a 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully, everybody say joyfully, carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And in the same way, Jesus says, There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. We see the heart of God towards lost people. Then he tells a second story. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and Sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy, everybody say joy, in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Now we have one more parable left in this three part sermon series by Jesus. There's one more parable left, but I want to pause right here and show you a pattern that is developing in these parables that Jesus is telling, which he's not trying to hide, are reflecting the heart of God towards the lost being found. The Jews were fine to let the lost stay lost, but Jesus was establishing the new covenant, which said that now it's Jews, Gentiles, everybody. He kicked open the doors and he said, now I'm letting everybody in. I'm bringing Jew, Gentile, slave, free. Everybody is welcome through faith in Jesus. Jesus is trying to establish. He is establishing the new covenant. And as he's telling these stories, telling them how the new way is going to work, there is a pattern that's developing. Number one, we see the relentless pursuit of the lost. Jesus says there's a hundred sheep. 99 are still there. There's only one that's lost. I don't know about you. I've never had sheep. We've had chickens. We had ducks. We've had, we have a pig. If you didn't know that your pastors had a pig, we we have a pig. We have a dog, and we have some bunnies. It's kind of like a farm. And, but I've never had sheep. I can't imagine, though, if I have 100 sheep out in the wilderness, and I'm watching those 100 sheep, and one gets lost, that I would leave the 99 to go find them. How many know we're just going to let that one go? Because I still got 99. I can't lose those. Can't let a predator come get those. Like I've, 
but, but we see a, a shepherd in Jesus' story that he makes up that is so consumed with the fact that he's lost this one stray sheep that he's going to leave the 99. He's gone from the 99, and he's going to go find that sheep. And what is Jesus trying to display to us? He's trying to display that that one sheep is really, really important. There was a time at, that we went bowling. We were with some friends and, and our family. We have, Brittany and I have four kids. Our youngest um, is, or our, our oldest is Rayleigh. Then we have Roman, Judah, Izzy. Roman was about five years old um, when this happened. We were at a bowling alley, and we're bowling, and at the end, everybody's getting their shoes on. There's a little arcade in the bowling alley. And as we're all getting stuff together, we've got four kids, Roman, makes his way to the arcade. We didn't know that. He makes his way to the arcade, five years old. And uh, Brittany realizes that Roman's not there, and she starts going, where's Roman? And I start looking around, I'm going, I don't know, where's Roman? And as if you're a parent and you've ever lost a child for a split second, this felt like 10 minutes. It was probably 30 seconds. It felt like 10 minutes. It's probably actually about two minutes. And, uh, and we realized we can't find Roman. There's people everywhere. It's kind of dark. There's an arcade. And you should have seen us. You, you should have seen my wife. You, you, you should have seen the, the, the scene. We made absolute fools of ourselves as we realized in that moment that one of our children was missing. Roman was nowhere to be found. My wife, Brittany, was standing on top of the table screaming, we can't find our son. Parents, you know that that's, that's real. You'd be doing the same thing. Roman, Roman, where is Roman? We can't find Roman. The terror that was in our hearts for that moment, that we don't know, and the bowling alley is attached to a mall, like we don't know what's, and all the thoughts that are running through your mind, like we are absolutely, you know what we weren't doing in that moment? We weren't like, well we still got three others. <laughs> Rayleigh and Judah and Izzy. No, 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 in fact, we didn't even care about them at that time. I was running. I, was, I, start, I darted towards the front. Brittany's on the table screaming. I mean, we probably left the other three in danger in that moment. Which I think communicates what Jesus is trying to say. Because somebody could say, well, what about the 99? Aren't they important too? That's not the point. The point is there is, such a, there is such a pursuit. There is such a distraction. There is such a passion about the thing that is lost because of the love for it. That it's like what the 99, no, no, there's a lost sheep. We found Roman, by the way. That's the end of the story. But the point is we were so distracted. It was like the other three, I'm not, it's not that I don't love them. Of course it's not that I don't love them. It's that it's not about them right now. It's about the lost. And what Jesus is trying to communicate is, yeah, she still had nine coins. Yeah, he still had 99 sheep. But when something is lost, we will turn over the couches. We will light a lamp. We will sweep the floor. We will leave the 99. We will do everything that we need to do to find the one. And you need to know that's how God feels about lost people. He's going, I love y'all sitting here in love church, but I'm distracted by the people that need to be here at Easter. I'm distracted by the people that are hurt. I'm distracted by the people. People that are far from me, stuck in sin, need to hear a message. I can't focus because I'm so consumed with the lost. And this is the, this is the, the theme, this is the feeling, this is the kingdom principle that Jesus is teaching that we need to realize. The first thing that we see in these parables is a relentless pursuit of the lost. And the second thing that you see in these parables is the extravagant celebration of the found. There is a celebration. We clap every, after every time we pray the prayer, inviting you know, people to, to make Jesus their Savior, and we pray, Jesus, come into my life, be my Savior today. I surrender my life to you. We clap. If you've never seen it, you'll see it today. Why do we clap? Because the Bible says, Jesus said, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. If one person gives their heart to Jesus, heaven's throwing a party, and we should too. So now let's look at the third story, and this is what I'll close with. To illustrate the point further, third story, three, it's important. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. 
You might have heard this story before, but I want you to listen with fresh ears today, fresh heart. Just, just lean into this for a minute. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I want my inheritance now. So his father agreed to de- divide his wealth between his two sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. I love how Jesus goes to a little bit of length to describe, he didn't have to do this, to describe the depravity of this boy, of this situation. He describes. He went, and it was great, wild living, party it up. That's great. You know, sometimes preachers will talk about how like, you know, the, the, when you go and you do that stuff, it's empty and there's no, there's no joy in that. No, we need to like keep it real. Like sometimes like sin feels fun for a minute. So, so I'm not telling you to sin. I'm saying it feels fun for a minute. Be honest. Then you, you gotta recognize that in order to understand that it's, a, it's bait, it's, it's a lure from the enemy because it feels fun for a minute but it's gonna leave you empty for a lifetime. It promises but doesn't deliver. It promises fulfillment, delivers emptiness. It it, it promises that it's gonna deliver you happiness, but it delivers despair. And so you see that as Jesus is describing, he he was living it up, baby. Got dad's inheritance and I'm living it up. But then you see this progression of he ran out and then there was famine in the land and now he's struggling. Now nobody's gonna give him anything. Now he's so desperate. And it says that he, that he comes, he finally came to his senses and he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. As we read this story in closing, I want you to be able to find yourself in this story. We don't don't have to read into it too much. Like, here's the main point of this story is God was illustrating that we are the lost son. So first and foremost, you need to understand, we are the lost son in this parable. And it's really important that you realize that, that we are the lost, we are the rebellious ones. Our sin, we talked about it a few weeks ago, our sin has left us totally separated from God. Our sin left us earning death as our reward, as our paycheck, the wages of sin is death. We are the lost son. But we also need to realize that we're the lost son in this parable where Jesus is illustrating what happens to lost children when they turn and decide to come home. And that turning represents the repentance of the son coming to his senses, realizing this is not all it was cracked up to be. I need to go home. And so he turns to go home, but he can't even get home before he gets loved by the father. We are the lost son. In other words, he hadn't even done any of his chores yet. I'll go home and I'll be the servant. I'll, I'll feed the animals. I'll, I'll, be, I'll work in the house. I'll clean the house. I'll farm. I'll do whatever is needed. He hadn't even done a chore. And the father meets him before he can even get to the doorstep saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You need to realize we are the lost son. And then it says, His son said back to his father, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father, now we see the heart of the father, said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. There it is again. You got the pursuit of the father leaving the door to go embrace his son. And now you have a celebration because the lost son has been found. For the son of mine, he says, was dead and now has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he has been found. So the party began. 
You need to know that that's the Father's heart towards us. This is what happens when we come to the Father. But I also want us to, to pull something from this story and realize that we, as the church of Jesus Christ, represent the loving Father to a lost and a hurting world. So, so watch this. In the story, we are the lost son, God's the Father, we know that. But, but you need to also realize one thing that we can pull from the story is we represent the loving Father in the earth. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus. And when people see us, like it or not, they are forming their opinion of who God is. And so it says that the Father leaves, he runs, just as the shepherd left the 99 and the woman didn't care about the nine coins as much as the one lost coin, the Father runs towards his lost son, embraces him, comes home, kill the calf, get the robe, get the ring. We're throwing a party for the lost son is home. This must be the attitude of the church. We must realize that we represent God to a broken and hurting world. And in verse 27, it says, when he returned home, this is the lost son, when he, when he returned, or no, no, sorry, I'm gonna back up yeah, verse 27. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. And they said, your brother is back and your father has killed the fattened calf and we're celebrating because of his safe return. Verse 28 says the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And his father came out and begged him to come in. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. The last thing that we must realize after looking at the story of Jesus displaying the heart of God to his children is that Jesus included the attitude and the spirit of the older brother, which represents the attitude and the spirit of a religious mind that is judging the people that God is showing forgiveness towards. And church, here's a third takeaway from this story. We reject the spirit of the older brother. We will never let an elitist attitude creep into this house. We will never let a religious spirit creep in. Listen, we, we believe the word of God. We understand sin and the consequence of sin. All of that is leading up to the truth. And this is why we're leading up to Easter with this. All of it is leading up to the truth that Jesus has died on the cross to offer forgiveness for sin for anyone who would believe this is the best news of history and we've been saved that way and we need to be distracted and passionate and in pursuit of others that need to be saved that way too. May we never get an attitude that says, I've earned my share, I've earned my place, they need to earn it too. Why would we celebrate? Why would we do that? Why would we be putting all this attention? Why, why are we gonna do an invite campaign? Are we just trying to get more people you know, to come through the doors? Absolutely we're trying to get more people to come through the doors. We wanna preach the gospel to as many people as we possibly can. We're trying to empty out hell. We're trying to populate heaven. We're trying to move the kingdom forward. This is what it all leads to. This is what it's all about. This is why we're talking about the consequence of sin so that we can talk about the solution to sin. We wanna leave the front door. We wanna go out and we wanna meet the lost and say, welcome home. And we're gonna throw a party while we're at it. You can go ahead and stand up because I'm gonna close. How do we keep this from happening? How do we keep the older brother's spirit from happening and keep the spirit of a loving father? There's just, there's just two things. I'm just gonna give them to you. I'm not gonna preach them, I'm gonna give them to you. Number one, we realize over and over that we are the lost son. And number two, we go after other lost sons. So may we never become 
the church that, I'm not talking about any particular church, by the way. I mean, you might have experienced one, but I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying it can so easily creep into our church or any church. May we never become the church that gets an attitude about broken, lost, dirty, despicable people being in this coming into the community. Because that was us too, but for the grace of God. And so how do we keep it from happening here? Realize that we are the lost son, find other lost sons. Realize, realize, I can't judge them, that's me. That's literally me before. And I'm in pursuit of other lost people. That's gonna keep the attitude of the older son out of this church. May we never have the attitude of the older son. May we always represent the attitude of our loving father. So, hey, when we, when we take a, a sticker, when we leave and we write a name, and I, I hope that you go and write lots of names, but when, we, when we're writing those names, it's us, that's, this is just a really practical, simple way of us going after lost people. And then we pray and then we invite. We pray for them and we're gonna continue to pray as a church, but then you gotta literally invite. You gotta leave the front porch. You gotta get out of your comfort zone and we've gotta go and we've gotta invite people. We, we wanna be passionate in pursuit of people that are lost, that need to be found. I want us to close our eyes. The first prayer that I wanna pray, we're gonna pray a couple prayers and sing a song to close. The first prayer that I wanna pray is I want, I want God to deposit a new level of faith and passion for the lost today. This is God's heart for the lost. Well, he's, he's made it clear that he came to turn this thing upside down. The reason that he could associate with sinners who hadn't been cleansed is because he became the cleansing. He became the way. And so in this same attitude, in this same pattern, we can go. We don't have to be afraid to associate with the lost. We don't have to be afraid to be associated with the sinner. It's literally our mandate. It's literally our pattern. Jesus tells us this. So I'm praying that a fresh deposit, a fresh passion for the lost would be placed in our hearts individually and in the heart of this church. So let's lift our hands to heaven. God, we pray for a fresh vigor, for a fresh energy, for a fresh vision for lost people. God, I pray that we would have a passion, that we wouldn't be complacent in our place in the house as the older brother that we wouldn't get judgmental in our place in the house as the older brother, but that we will keep the attitude of a loving father saying, we are the lost son that has been found and we wanna be consumed with finding other lost sons. We wanna be distracted by the lost. Place on our minds friends, place on our minds family members, place on our minds coworkers, place on our minds other students, teammates that we play sports with, young people. Place on our minds those people that we haven't talked to in a while, that we could re-engage. Place on our minds people that are hurting. Bring people into our path that we don't even know yet. God, I pray that you would bring opportunity after opportunity to invite people in to hear the greatest news on the planet that that our sin had separated us from God, but the death and the resurrection of Jesus has made a way back to him. God, give us a passion that we've never had before. In Jesus' name, come on, ask him for it right now. Ask his Holy Spirit to fill you with the heart of God, the heart that says mercy will triumph over judgment, the heart that says I'm going after the lost. Come on, ask him right now. God, give it to us, give it to us. Give us a passion for the lost. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, align us with your heart. Align us with your spirit in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Put your hands down across this place, and whether you're online or in person, we're gonna take a moment and invite those who need that very love and forgiveness that I've been talking about. Maybe you're here today or you're watching today and you feel like the lost son that is still lost and you feel like that lost son that's coming to his senses saying, I need to come home. If you need to come home to God today, Maybe you've walked away from God or maybe you've never made the decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you wanna do that today. Here's what we're gonna do in this moment. We're gonna put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I'm gonna say a prayer, I'm gonna lead in a prayer and we're all gonna pray this prayer out loud. The Bible says when we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with our mouth that he's risen from the dead, then we will be saved. And we're gonna lead in that prayer and everybody's gonna get a chance to pray that online and in person. But before we do that, 
I wanna just ask you to uh, do one thing and that's to lift a hand when I count to three to signify that this is you, that you're coming to Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the first time or lifting a hand saying, I'm coming back to Jesus. I feel like the lost son that strayed away and needs to come back home. And so I'm gonna count to three in a moment because I wanna know who I'm praying with and I want, I want you to have a chance to externally symbolize this inward faith that's rising up on the inside. And when I say three, I want you to lift a hand. If you're online, I want you to let us know in the comments or send us a message as people do just about every week online and let us know I'm praying this prayer. I'm, I'm coming to Jesus as my savior. So here we go, all across this room, everybody online, when I say three, lift a hand if you wanna come home to Jesus. Here we go, one, two, three. Come on, lift your hand high in the air if that's you. I see you right back there. I see you and I see you. Three hands up immediately, that's awesome. Come on, if you're online, let us know. I see you, God bless you, ma'am. That is so good right here. God bless you. That's awesome. That's awesome. God loves you. He sees your faith. That's what your hand represents is the faith that's rising up. He's wrapping his arms around you right now in love. Oh, this is so good. Let's, let's pray this prayer. You can put your hands down. Let's pray this prayer, everybody, but specifically you five and anybody who responded online, I want you to repeat this after me. Here we go. Everybody pray. God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I receive you into my life as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me. I repent and turn to you. I wanna live every day for you, Jesus, and accomplish the purpose you have for me. Thank you for what you've done. Amen and amen. Come on, now let's celebrate like heaven is celebrating, everybody.